Stay tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guests waiting to be profiled are actor Aaron Yu and author Margaret Ajemian Onhert. Born in Texas and raised in New Jersey, actor Aaron Yu, as his bio states, is one of the most sought after Asian American <laughs> actors in the industry. <laughs> Who wrote that? You're not saying that, Aaron. <laughs> yeah, You've right? seen him on TV in Law and Order, Love Monkey, The Bedford Diaries, and on the screen in Disturbia, Rocket Science, The Namesake, and American Pastime. Aaron graduated from the University of Pennsylvania where he studied theater. Did you decide to go to New York or come to be a film star? Uh, I went to New York first. You did? Yeah, because I wanted to be hungry. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I went to New York and, and um, uh, all my friends are going there for business, actually. And, you know, I, I was raised in theater, you know, dreams of, um, of, of the group theater. And your own dreams or your no, family's just dreams? Like, no, just like every, every kid's. I don't know, it used to be back in the day that you, you, you would go, like, they, back in the day they had, uh, had Strasburg and Adler and all these people that started in New York and then went to L.A. Oh, like, your heroes it. growing up, you know, right. Brando started in New York, right. went to L.A. Right. So Everybody. you were thinking of that, you have to be yeah, on the stage you first. you know, yeah, kind of, kind of that sort of thing. No one does it that way anymore. Now oh, they, they go. Don't? No, they go to. You can't do. They do big plays in New York now with kids who, um, you know, were on TV shows on the CW. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Well, and that draws in the audience. Yeah, I know. It's 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 kind of uh, it's kind of criminal. They they they. I read it. I read in the in the Voice, the Village Voice, um, about this play that they brought all these like TV and, and, and movie stars like like kids, but like you know, quote unquote famous. And in the article, they were literally quoting them as saying, or like saying that so and so, like not only had never done a play before, had never stepped foot inside of a theater <gasps> until they started rehearsals. Criminal. And I was like, criminal. Whatever. You, uh, you did off Broadway though. Yeah, so you yeah, did yeah, do yeah. a lot of stage work. Sure. Yeah. I, I was once again very hungry for a very long time. Do you think it helped <laughs> you in your film career? Uh, yeah, I think it taught me how to act. I mean, there's a lot of things that there's a learning curve with film too. You know, there was there's a lot of stuff uh, that right. you can never you, you would never get on uh, on stage. I mean, they're 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 two different um, they're they're just two different mediums. It's like painting with painting with oils or sculpting. You know. Yeah, I always thought that they weren't anything alike, and yet a lot of actors say, well, if I don't get, hadn't been on the stage, I wouldn't have been able to do this. You know, this. there are certain things that you won't ever get to do, uh, like, uh, on film that you get to do on stage, uh, vice versa. Although, one of the books that, that is, like, my acting Bible, I guess, is, like, um, Six Lessons on Acting by Richard Boleslavsky, and he wrote, he wrote it right when, when talkies were, were oh. first coming in. And and he he and and this is in the 1930s and this he's this huge Russian Stanislavski and tradition like uh, uh, actor and, and teacher and he was just like no man you have you have this new medium where you can like like put yourself on 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 film for posterity and then go back and watch it and learn from it and and why wouldn't you want to do that if you're given the opportunity of course uh -huh. you know most actors I know like you want to watching yourself on film and just like cringing because you notice all these little things that no one else ever does. You're just like, why am I standing like that? What are, what are you doing with your mouth right now? But is like, that because the, the director's telling you to do that? No, 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 no. It's, no? Just, it's just insecurity. <laughs> is that yeah, what it is? That's all it is. Well, when, so when did your big break come? When, as soon as you got to L.A.? I, I don't know. Everyone wants to kind of like... Make a big break for you? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, 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 I've, I've been doing this for about four years, and, and I feel like there's been several, mm. you know, I remember when I got my first paying theater gig, 
uh, which was like two hundred and like forty dollars a week or something like that. And uh, I quit my bartending job, which wasn't particularly intelligent to do that because you can't live on that. But you were you were keeping your but life together like, as a bartender, not a waiter, right? Yeah, <laughs> and I was and I was like, but two hundred to just to get paid to do something that you would do for free. I was uh, uh, on set early this year, or we were at lunch, and they feed you so well on <laughs> on like movie sets, especially like they feed you so well, and you're sitting there, we're sitting there, and I've got like three plates of food because I eat like a you know, um, uh, the whole pen of hogs. And uh, I looked at my friend and I was like, and the trip of it is, I would, no, 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 I wouldn't even just do this for you. I would pay money to get to do what we do. You know <laughs> yeah, what I mean? Yeah. To get fed like this and then go out and be like, oh, let's, let's throw ourselves on the floor for a little bit and play like make-believe. But you were just talking about when, when you did American Pastime with Desmond Nakano directing you, that you had lost some weight, you were telling me. Oh, yeah. Or you'd gained some weight. No, I gained some, <laughs> yeah. Because uh, um, <coughs> this is normally about where I am, you know, um, and, uh, um, and which works out for well for me because I'm always <laughs> playing like high school kids or whatever. Um. But I had to play like a baseball player and, and, and I remember when Desmond in American Pastime. In American yeah. Pastime, I played a baseball player, and and and, and Desmond oh, oh, Nakano, our director, when he gave me the role, I think we were standing at uh, Vicky Thomas's office, our casting director's office, and he was just like, he's like, no, no, you know, you, you've got the role. It's just, um, it's just. Um, I was like, what? And he's like, yeah, you're you're a little scrawny. <laughs> Is that and what I said? was like, <laughs> Desmond, I'm taller than you. I'm bigger than you. How dare? I was just like. What? <laughs> um, so uh, so I went and I, I I hit the gym and and put on like ten pounds, which for me is kind of a lot of just like oh, you working out, like yeah. muscle. And yeah, and then were since I uh, oh, it's great because you can eat like a cow <laughs> every day, and it's all going somewhere, you know. <laughs> so true. no, it's it's great, but it's awesome. They gave me like a pitching instructor, uh, um, um, uh, Bob Kais, who uh, who rehabbed Hideo Nomo. And like resuscitated oh. <laughs> his career, like did mechanics for Oral Hershiser, like used to do uh, do 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 uh, um, work on the uh, pitching co the the pitching coaching staff of the Mets when Bobby Valentine was. Did you know anything manager. about baseball? I mean, I played. I mean, I've been a baseball fan. I've been a Mets fan since uh, since like '85. So American Pastime is the story of. Tell us about it. Uh, since we're we're already to American Pastime, right. I wanted to ask you about some of these know. other things. Um, American Pastime is uh, the story of a of a um, of a Japanese American family who gets sent to the internment camps during World War II. Um, and their, how their story gets intertwined with a white American family uh, um, who is working at that camp. And, um, you know, it's a story, basically, it's all, ba like, a lot of it's based on true material, either from people's lives or, or from uh, historical record, that, you know, 120,000 Japanese Americans were put into internment camps. Did or not Japanese, mo like, uh, the, uh, the majority of which were Japanese Americans. But did you know about that? From your uh, yeah, family there was, talking? Well, no, because, you know, I'm Korean, actually. I'm oh, Korean, you're Korean? I'm Korean-American. So? So I, what I got was, like, two sentences in my history book in high school. Like, oh, Japanese were sent to internment camps. Oh, that sucked. Too bad. And we came, we, and uh, 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 I met Tom Gorai, like, uh, two years ago, just in a hallway. <laughs> and uh, um, I, I forget sometimes to tell people this story, but that I was, like, sitting around in a hallway working somewhere else. Um, and Tom walked by and he was like, are you Japanese? And I was like, no, I'm not, I just look it. <laughs> and he was like, come talk to me whenever you're done doing what you're doing. And he's one of the producers on the film. And he oh. told me this story. He goes, look, oh. I have a story about Japanese American internment. And I was just like, oh my God, I barely remember even hearing about yeah, this. Yeah, that's what I wondered. And the story is that, you know, when they're in there, instead of being rebels or whatever, being, you know, some of them did re like, you know, uh, 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 act up or whatnot, but the vast majority of them we're like, look, we're in this position. We're going to make the best out of it. We're That's gonna, what's so uplifting yeah. about the film. And you, and when you're watching it, you think, how can they be doing that? How can she be sewing well, curtains for her yeah. little windows? You know. You know, it's <laughs> funny. You see the uh, if you when you see the documentary footage, like the actual footage from back then, you're kind of like, oh, you see all these 
we were we, we were watching it. We were like, why is everyone so happy? I know. And everyone, and then finally someone was like, no, these are the these are the propaganda films that the U.S. government oh. was making. Half of these films that are are in there, That's they're like they're basically telling people, let's be happy and smile. God. Let's do let's shoot the marching band. And we're like, oh, okay, we get it. But the the truth of it is, it's sort of like. They're showing these kids coming out of like classrooms and whatnot, but they're not the ones who put the classrooms in there. It was the Japanese community that went in there and they said, okay, if oh, we're gonna be here it. forever, right. our kids need to learn something. Right. So they're the ones who made the schools, and then the government came in and was just like, oh, well, we've got schools in our camps, and yeah. you're just like, oh, wow, oh, and then brilliant. They, then they exploited you. Yeah, they exactly. Were, they were so industrious, the Japanese oh, people. Oh, they were, there. yeah. I think the funny thing when I was talking to you the other day is I thought it was great when you said, I have four films in the can, and oh, I thought, that yeah. is something, because you had Disturbia, you had Rocket sure. Science. Yeah, you Rocket Science was actually the first one that I did. That was what I did out of New York. And and who was the director on that? Uh, Jeffrey Blitz. He did um, Spellbound, the documentary, Academy Award nominated. This and Mira, Mira Nair you worked with? Yeah, I worked with her. I had a small part in uh, in The Namesake. She, that, I guess that was, I was technically the first film role that I ever did. I, I, I like Rocket Science was my first lead, so. But I did, I did The Namesake a couple months before that. That was like one of my first great, amazing lessons about about acting and, or not acting or and learning. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. Like you go through, you go through all sorts of different stages of. I mean, I think if you're not screwing up all the time, you're probably not. Well, some things you should be avoiding <laughs> or whatever. But learning is about falling and scraping your knee and getting up and, right. and going again, so, right? Yeah. And it's sort of like I did this. Um, I made this terrible decision. I uh, very first film role I ever got. Been doing theater for a while, and uh, I get. I get this small part in a Mira Nair film, The Namesake, one of my favorite, right. favorite books of all time. Right. And I was like, this is amazing. Um, so uh, the weekend before, I'm supposed to shoot a Monday, and I agreed to, to go to Pennsylvania, to the middle of Pennsylvania, and shoot a friend's grad thesis oh, film yeah. or something. <laughs> something. Yeah, you're gonna star in it, right? Yeah, you know, and I was just like, can we reschedule it? I, this is not good news. I'm probably, they're gonna call, probably call me to get picked up at like six o'clock in the morning or whatever. Uh, yeah. Or meet some car somewhere, blah, 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 you know? And, and my friend was like, I can't really reschedule it. I was just like, well then, can you recast me? He's like, no, I really need you to do it. And I was like, uh. I was like, all right, you have to guarantee me that I'm going to be back in New York, in my apartment in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, <laughs> by 11 p.m. on Sunday night. And? 2.30 in the morning, three o'clock in the morning, something around there, like, I'm still coming through Manhattan. <laughs> oh, and I'm like, this is such bad news. At that point, I'd already been told that I needed to be picked, I needed to be, meet a car in Manhattan at like five o'clock in the morning. Oh dear, so you should have just driving, stayed in Manhattan. Yeah, because we were driving to upstate right. New York like an hour away. I decided, okay, I'm gonna go home. So I go home and then I think, well, I could sleep for like two hours, take a shower, <laughs> or maybe an hour and a half and take a shower. And like I haven't really slept all weekend because it's just some kind of like, you know, like it was just. Right. And then I was just like, uh, at the time I was also getting sick. Oh dear. And so, so this I is go to sleep. Film? I go to sleep and I, and, I, and I set my phone and I set my alarm. My phone I leave on silent. I, I left the ringer off on my phone and my alarm clock was broken. Oh, I stop woke up. It. No, I swear to God, I woke up at like 8 o'clock in the morning. <gasps> you missed your 5 o'clock call. I missed my 5 o'clock call. I was like, my career is over. I just give slept us a happy through. ending. N that, you know, strangely enough, Mira is Mira was such a sweetheart. She's such an angel that like, uh, she was just like, I still want you to come in and do your other scene. Oh, thank and, God. And I came in <laughs> and uh, and 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 uh, got put into a chokehold by Mira Nair in the middle of the street in Chelsea, New York, uh, in New York. Which is kind of a life experience. So happy to see you. Exactly. I know. The thing is, you think if you mess up on something like that, you'll never get another role because you know, it'll be bad. I, words. I always feel like you know mistakes shouldn't. I mean, you shouldn't be actively be 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 uh, you know um, that kind of person. But like people are allowed to make mistakes and people are allowed to learn from them. And if you, as long as your spirit's the right, in you know you in the right it. vein, yeah. And you were right, right. Uh, I hope so. <laughs> and I want you to keep doing it because there's a lot of energy there. Yeah. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks for watching this part of the Joan Quinn Profiles. We'll be right back with author Margaret Honert.
Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome back to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Author Margaret Ajemian Honert was born and raised in the Bronx, New York. She has a Bachelor of Arts from Goddard College and an MFA from Goucher College. She graduated from the Barnes Foundation. Margaret worked in TV documentaries, was a docent at the Met and the Philadelphia Museum of Art, and she taught art application in the um, Art Goes to School program in the elementary classes. Was that kind of an outgrowth of your Barnes um, experience? Yes, it was, Joan. It was, um, it was something we took to children in the inner city who didn't always get to a museum. So we took reproductions in and discussed oh. them, and then they learned about Picasso and Rembrandt through these reproductions. When you were at uh, Goucher and Goddard, what were you looking at career-wise? Were you going to be an author? Well, I've always been thinking about this book, and I've been talking to my mother all my life, and she was telling me her stories most of my life. Because this is your first book. This is my first book. Uh -huh. And, and it was called? my master's thesis. Oh, it was? Yes. At, what, at, at, uh, at Goucher. At Goucher. At Goucher. The Knock at the Door, um, which I think is just the best title. Because well, you, you always wonder what's on the other side of the door, right? Well, that is exactly what happened. The Turkish soldiers came one day and knocked at her door. So it was, seemed to be the perfect title. They were not prepared and they had to leave, so it was most appropriate. So for a long time, you were talking to your mother, you said, as you were getting this book ready, but in the meantime, you were uh, applying your arts in different ways. And uh, you have, I thought this was very funny, a 100-ton master captain's license? Yes. What is that? Well, that means I could take the Circle Line cruise around Manhattan and run the boat. <laughs> Is that what it means? You, like a master captain? Yes. Well, it's a, it's a what big you, boat. It's what do you a, have to do? You, do have you have to learn about the waterways in Michigan. You have to learn about the waterways in Europe. You have to learn about everything you'll never use. You're kidding. Were you studying that? Why yes. were you doing that? Well, we have a boat, and my husband was a boater, and so we were between captains, and one of us said, let's take this test so we can have this. And it turned out to be fun. I enjoyed it. I loved it so much I almost became a teacher. <laughs> is, is that right? Yeah. Well, once you start memorizing these rules of the road, there's a lot to learn. And, and then it becomes a r by rote. Now I don't remember anything. I oh, probably wouldn't oh. be able to run the boat at all either. But it was kind of funny because thinking about you and seeing your PR pictures and thinking, this woman is a hunter and a fisherman. She doesn't look like she can do that stuff. That's the good thing. The elk don't know. I don't look like a hunter. So when they see me out in the woods, they just say, oh, it's just some old woman. Were you actually hunting? Do you, do yes. You, do yeah, you, I have. I shot a thousand pound elk. Yes. Well, you're surprising me in shot. many ways. Well, I surprise myself sometimes, too. The, um, talking about your book, I, uh, your boat, I know you spent a lot of time on Bimini, which is a small island where off Florida? It's a, uh, 60 miles off the Florida coast, and my husband and I spent a lot of time fishing there. And During those times, there's a little spot called uh, The Pines, and I start my book there. Oh, that's it. I start my book at The Pines, where I kind of talk to my father, supposedly there's a vortex there, like Stonehenge. Oh, that you, oh, and that you. <laughs> somewhat, yeah, and you get this wonderful out-of-body feeling or unearthly thing, and people come. Do uh, they, to yes, experience it? Yes, they come to experience it because some say that the um, Bimini Island was a mountaintop in Atlantis. Wow, I didn't know that. I was in Bimini once. Well, there you go. <laughs> didn't you didn't know, anything. you didn't feel it. Well, you have to go up there and, uh, experience it. You spent a lot of time there and because of your charity work and you worked in the schools, you now have a foundation named in your I do. husband's. My husband Bob was a great fisherman. Uh, he's in the Fishing Hall of Fame. And, really? Yeah, in Bimini. And uh, we were named Biminiites by the governor of Nassau. It was a very big honor. So we spent a lot of time there and I set up a foundation after he died six years ago to support children of Bimini and their school education. That's so noble. Well, it was something he would have liked, I know. 
And and do you have is, is it renewed all yes, the, every yes, year? Yes, yes, in in process now. So, were you in Bimini when you decided to write your book? Well, yes. Actually, I, start the well, writing process. Well, I started writing before I went to Bimini, but I was always writing during the time I was there, and I uh, started the book there, the first chapter and the prologue, uh, the prologue and the epilogue are at Bimini. So how do you do it? Did you physically write it? Did you have a computer? No, I always wrote longhand, longhand. on yellow pads. You did do that? Always, and uh, notebooks. And when I interviewed my mother, who lived to be 98, I always wrote down our conversations. Oh, that was smart. It was and, like a diary in a way, Well, when right? you're working on your master's degree in journalism, oh. you're told to journal, and you're writing down everything. I would, if I couldn't be oh. talking to you right now, I'd be writing this conversation down. Oh, <laughs> that's why. I forgot this was part of your master's. Part of my master's. Oh. And part of the master's degree is to write, write, write. Every minute of your waking hours, you're writing oh. something. So with interviewing your mother, uh, did you interview other people? Did you interview any no. of her friends? I, well, we talked, but I, I did. This is not a book about the genocide as a whole. This is a mother-daughter story, and it's her story and my story. There's a lot about me in here that probably you didn't really care to know. Like I, sh I wanted to <laughs> shave my legs, and my mother wouldn't let me. And <laughs> so there's a lot of silly stuff and fun stuff. My mother shares her recipes. Uh, she talks about her youth. I talk about my youth. So yeah. it's really a mother-daughter story. The physical part of the writing is interesting because you start, you do like 19, what, 98 or something, some year, and then you take it back to her time. Yes. So you have one chapter yes. like that or an intro, and yes. then you have what she was doing how much earlier? Well, uh, Publishers Weekly thought that was a wonderful transition. Was that it, your own idea? It was my own idea. Because it's really great. Well, I mean, it you works. Can tell. It yeah. seems to work, and they called it a controlled narrative, which is oh. when you think about what I'm writing about, people sometimes get a little um, dramatic or overly dramatic, and I love their compliment of controlled and contained narrative. Like this is. Margaret, this, this chapter 13, October 1998, and it's called Eagle on the Perch. Then chapter 14 is The Escape. Right. And it's Esther, your mother, in June 1918. Well, if you go to the page before, though, that I segue into that. From you, what you've done. From what yeah, I've that's done. What I mean. so and talking does. with my mother, I will have said perhaps, Mother, tell me how it was. Tell me how your life was before the soldiers came. Uh -huh. And then that segues into the chapter in her voice. So how did she remember all of this? Did she have problems remembering? My mother was an amazing woman. She remembered every detail of her life. And it's interesting because having taken so many psychology courses in my undergraduate degree, I learned that the mind is an amazing thing. It remembers what it remembers. Uh -huh. It doesn't remember more, and it doesn't remember oh, just... less. <laughs> and my mother's stories were always the same. When you talk about this as being a mother-daughter, but it's also um, a pertinent to all ethnic groups, because if it's a mother-daughter, all ethnic groups exactly. can go through the same kind of things you're talking about. Exactly. But this is different because it's so barbaric. And the things she remembers, and as you say, she just keeps saying the same. She remembers, she remembers them the over. same stories, but only chapter eight is barbaric. And I don't don't be turned off by that. It, no, it isn't the, all a down story. I didn't story. mean barbaric in the fact that the writing is barbaric, but but the way people were treated. What she lived through, exactly. No, that was that is exactly what happened to her. But what's amazing about her and uplifting is that it didn't affect her life. It affected mine. Yeah, because she seemed to always be, and, and you see survivors, yes. genocide, Armenian genocide survivors, are always so up, and most of them don't like to talk about it because they want to move on. Well, they want to move on, and interestingly enough, I had lunch with Henry Morgenthau at his home, and we cro sat across the table, and he said, Margaret, did it ever occur to you that when the Armenian survivors came to this country in 1916 and 17, they told one another Mortzid, which is the Armenian word for forget. Yes, you use that in the book. I use it in the book. And my mother, my father would tell my mother Mortzid, 
and Armenians told each other, Mortsid, like, forget, forget it, it forget, forget it. it, move on. And they came to this country, started a new life, and assimilated. They learned mm -hmm. the English language, right. they became citizens, they tried to forget. Yes. The Jewish people, Henry said, Margaret, when the Jews survived the Holocaust and came to this country, they told one another, remember, yeah. remember, never again remember. He said, did you ever think about the fact that this is called the forgotten genocide? Because when the Armenians told oh, one right. another to forget, the world forgot. That's very interesting. And one thing before we leave, I know you, you've had these write-ups in the New York Times, and it was because at one of your readings and book signings, you were had this major Turkish display. It was it was not uh, expected. And it made twice in the New York Times. Made the front cover of the metro section, two columns, and yeah. actually they did me a favor. I don't think they <laughs> planned to do that, but it was very frightening, Joan, and I, I didn't sleep that night. I wondered what, what was I doing. What did they just disturb your... I started to read. They picked the wrong night. I had a former governor of New York in the audience. I had Robert Morgenthau, the district attorney currently of New York, in the audience. So if you're going to pick a night, that was not the one. Right. Uh, and they stood up and sh passed out pamphlets saying it's all a lie. There never was a genocide. Oh, Margaret Honored is lying. And uh, I was frightened. But the police came. They resisted arrest. That was a bad thing to do. They were hauled off to jail. I think one of them is still in jail. But that just goes to show you, you have the support of government there, yes, really, correct. And, and friends. And I'm so glad you wrote the book. I loved it. I never put it down. Well, everyone like, loves my mother. Did you <laughs> love my they, say, uh, they call me and say, Margaret, I love your mother, Esther. Yeah, so that's, that's so a good great. thing. She would have loved it, too. Thank you, Margaret. You're welcome, Joan. Thank you for having me. And keep riding to 777 South Figueroa, 44th floor, Los Angeles 90017. Bye.